My name is uh, Gabriela Ramos, and I am the Assistant Director General for Social and Human Sciences. Sciences are the basis of human knowledge, and, and of course it helps us as a society, but it also helps us as humans to, to manage better our lives. So this is a core to UNESCO that is there to promote peace. Well, it's very interesting, and, and, and few people have this top of mind, that UNESCO is the only institution in the UN system, and I would say in the multilateral setting, that has ethics of science and technology as a mandate. And, and of course we say, what about ethics? It seems like a, just for reflection, just for intellectual purposes, just because we want to be well informed. The reality is that the ethics encompasses the purpose-led technological development. So it's not the technology, is the purpose of that technology to help us humans to build more sustainable, inclusive societies in general, and to ensure that the technologies are not an end in itself, but just a mean to contribute to this building of societies that are more manageable and more inclusive. And the ethics, if you think about it, of course, is this reflection of what is wrong, what is the moral grounds, but it's also defined at UNESCO, first and foremost, to protect and promote human rights and human dignity. But not only that, because with the climate uh, crisis in which we are now, with the planetary catastrophe in so many fields, we are not talking now about human-centric. We are talking planet-centric. And therefore, it's, it's a human, but it's a human also in its relationship with the environment, is a human in the relationship with the society, is a human and the responsibility that we have also vis-a-vis -vis others, vis-a-vis -vis the future generations, vis-a-vis -vis the, the other livings. And therefore, I think that this definition of ethics is all-encompassing, but is really the framework that we should have, not only for science, I would say for everything, but we have it here as a very core mandate. Defining what is ethics is almost a circular argument, because the fact is that there is not one single ethics. Ethics depends of, of culture, depends of cult, uh, countries, uh, context, depends of historical facts, depends of many things. And, and that's why even how you define ethics, you need to do it ethical. And you do it ethical when you do it pluralistic, when you ensure that diverse voices are heard, when you ensure that um, different points of view, even conflicting points of view are put at the table, and also if you do it in a multidisciplinary fashion. And I give an example. Very interestingly, when we started to define the ethics of artificial intelligence, the director general appointed 24 experts from all over the world. UNESCO do, does that. We need to have representativeness from countries in the north, countries in the south, east, west, but also from very different disciplines. And that was fascinating because having in the same room the anthropologues, the sociologues, the geeks, you need the geeks to understand the technologies, the engineers, but also the psychologists. Uh, it gives you another trust, another understanding. And what comes out is not only a technologically um, a solid proposition, but also something that takes into account the broader societal goals. And I think this is the most important contribution that UNESCO has done. Those that say that, that uh, uh, international institutions just produce words or papers or agreements uh, do not understand the power of multilateralism. The fact is that, yes, sometimes you have conventions that are binding. You just need to deliver, and that's it. Uh, but then there is a, a wide array of tools that multilateralism has to deliver change. And therefore, we measure our action by how much we change with our decisions the, 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 the future of the countries and the situation of the specific countries. I am a believer of the soft law, of the soft power of these institutions. Why? Because first, let's not underestimate the, the, the great contribution that a common narrative can make. When you put in the table 193 countries that are the members of UNESCO to agree and what does it mean to have the ethics of science, the ethics of artificial intelligence, the ethics of Internet of Things, the ethics of neurotechnology? You are creating a narrative, and narratives matter for action, to inform action. So that 
in itself, it's a very important contribution, creating a common narrative. Second, it's not that we just say, okay, now we agree on that we need to proceed uh, uh, to protect human rights in the, in the digital space. We have the means to follow up. First, because UNESCO has uh, very clear, uh, or, or members of UNESCO had very clear responsibilities in, in ensuring that they implement what they sign. But second, because we also have the tools. And I will give you an example. When, when the Bioethics um, Committee produced the, the Ethic of the Bound, no? La, the Declaration on Human Genome, uh, first and foremost, we realized that there was no uh, responsibility in the governments, sole responsibility in the governments to, to figure out how to handle these things. And therefore, the next step with members was to build the Bioethics Committees in the countries. So this institutional progress that we made and that, that now there's no country that will approve anything that comes from bioethical uh, 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 technologies if it is not reviewed by the bioethics committees. And therefore this institutional innovation meant that what was agreed in UNESCO related to frame the issues in an ethical way translated into bringing the capacities of the governments to look at the specific cases and define it also through the ethical lenses. Does all the countries uh, uh, move in the same direction with the same speed and with the same power and exert change in the same manner? No. There are different capacities, there are different commitments, they sometimes have very strong leadership, sometimes they don't. But at the end, what happens is that you create this uh, race to the top in the sense of members wanting to deliver for good. And if they see that something is working and they learn from each other also because that brings this uh, possibility, I think that we make, uh, we make progress and we make impact. The way we frame the, the ethical reflection in UNESCO can provide a lot of answers. Ethical reflection in UNESCO is about solidarity, is about no harm, it's about respecting uh, rights, it's about responsibility, it's about accountability, it's about uh, asking the right questions. Maybe we have too many uh, solutions uh, instead of asking the right questions, and that's what the social and human sciences provide, asking the right questions. And I presented a, a seminal uh, report that is related to geoengineering, the ethics of geoengineering. We are now trying to put all the policy options for delivering on the climate transition, all the policy options. And you need to put a tax on carbon and you need to invest more on renewables and you need to use less car or, or, or eat less meat or change the food system. All of these things are fine. One of the possible solutions that is very controversial is to change the climate through technological means, to reduce the solar radiation that reaches the earth the planes that are now being planes are now being built in the US which is one of the leading countries to prove that that is possible that you can go in the, the stratosphere deliver some chemicals reactions and avoid that the that the solar uh, lights came so badly and with that we're safe are we should we Who's taking the decision? Who's governing this? Do we have all the science to do that? Is it going to be only for those that can afford to it? Are you going to consider those that are living behind? Are the countries of the South with the boys at the table of those that might take or not take that decision? Are we going to do it? That's the ethics of science. We have the capabilities, we have the technologies, we have the human progress, it's just the human ingenuities with no boundaries. The question is, should we? And I think this is powerful at UNESCO because this ethical reflection that is pluralistic, as I said, diverse, open, is only looking to have inclusive and fair outcomes, which are somewhat lacking in the world that we have today and you apply it to the climate change and your engineering, but you also apply it to neurotechnologies because now we can map the brain. I mean, it's just amazing. The technologies are amazing. You can map the brain. You can know 
what people uh, react or not react, we might have a cure for Alzheimer. We might have enhancers and then you can learn faster and be smarter and you can because the technology is there. The question, should we? And again, who takes the decision, who is at the table, who finances, and how do we protect or prevent the misuse of these technologies? Because remember that the ethical reflection in UNESCO started when science was mis misused by fascist and, and non-democratic governments. And therefore, there was this very strong will to say science for human progress, for human dignity, and for human rights. And we should always remember that. Because science, you can use it for good and for bad. And therefore, for UNESCO, we really need to ensure that it's used in an ethical manner. I think this is the most important contribution that we can make. I believe in the power of evidence and science. And I can tell you that, uh, for example, with the recommendation on the ethics of artificial intelligence, we are reframing the debate. And governments are really taking, taking it up for them to implement it. And why is it different? Because the way the artificial intelligence, which is this capacity of the computers to use data to produce solutions, because that's in general, of course, there are many ways of doing artificial intelligence, but it, there is nothing else than more analytical power to do things, to analyze uh, data, is uh, highly concentrated. Few countries, five countries in the world are producing all the developments, and I would say mainly only two, which is uh, the US and China, are non diverse. 80% of these technologies, or 85%, are being produced by male only teams from the North, therefore, in one language, with one mindset, with one culture. And then the way we govern data, which is global, because data is transferable across boundaries. Uh, or I may say is not governed because data belongs to those that can harness it, that can recollect, collect it, and that can use it. And therefore what we are doing, the way these technologies are being deployed, is that we are going to be maximizing and increasing the inequalities and unfairness in the world. And therefore with, with the way we brought the recommendation to say first, data needs to belong to the person that produces it. This rule of consent that we do so fast in the internet needs to change because then your data is using for many other purposes that you don't even know. And then you, you have the meddling in democracies and you have the Cambridge Analytic and you have all these problems that are happening or discrimination, just plain discrimination. Second, you need to have the ethical framework. It's not about the technology. It's not about whether you can use these technologies to produce the vaccine of COVID in one month, in one year instead of eight years because of the analytical capacities. It's how do you ensure that whatever result is going to be fair, is going to be non-discriminatory, and is going to respect human rights and human dignity. In the world of the economic thinking, everything was macro, no? We have the neoliberal, the consensus of Washington, no? Telling just get markets right, it will work. Uh, limit the space of governments for interfering to the minimum, and uh, and uh, uh, the benefits of growth will deliver for all. No, the the way will lift all the boats. It's not true. And therefore, the contribution of most that was super interesting is that they went to very contextual environments that didn't happen. In the, in, the, in the mainstream economic thinking. The mainstream economic thinking was one size fits all, representative agents, uh, rational decision making, so averages, GDP, GDP growth. We measure progress by how much we produce and consume, that was it. What most did well was to go to very concrete problems of communities. And we created the most schools. So if you are a policymaker in Ghana, no, in one of the villages that want to understand better how to distribute the resources to improve um, the health conditions of certain communities, most was this powerful convenient, convener of the experts on those issues, international and national, and with the policymakers. And then they produce 
solutions. We just had one most school in the in the Caribbean that was amazing because they were talking actually about about climate change. What is lacking, and we are now building it, is this broader narrative. What most has to say regarding development and development paths? What most has to say about inclusive growth? What most has to say about the mainstream economic thinking to deliver better solutions and to move away from this mantra that the markets always deliver better because it's not true. We have the financial crisis, we have COVID, we have climate. Don't deliver better. You need policies, but you need good policies. And now most, uh, I'm very happy because members of the of the governing board, uh, body of this of this program approved uh, the most strategy 2022-2029. And what they said is we need to understand better the impact of the digital transformation, the climate emergencies, demographics, because demographics entails aging in some countries and migration in another, and the question of inequalities. These four trends that for me are defining the world as we know it, need to be better understood and better managed. And we produce a report that is uh, the Resilient and Inclusive Societies uh, with La Fundación La Caixa, who is our partner, that makes a call to incorporate equity and sustainability consideration ex ante, because they're always exposed. You take economic decisions to increase growth, to increase productivity, and then you say, Ah, yes, but I need to do some redistribution. I need to do some social programs. Ah, I need to fix the environment. I forgot to include the environment in my decision making. What we're saying is no. Whenever you're going to take a decision of any investment, any economic policy, you need to have the efficiency argument, the cost benefit, traditional uh, definitions, but then you need to, to put the lenses of how this decision is going to contribute or not to close the inequality gaps. Very straightforward. How any decision is going to affect women? How many decisions are going to affect those at the, at the bottom of the income distribution? These lenses, we need to put it first. How that decision is going to impact the environment? And this is what we're trying to do with most. So I think there's going to be a most renaissance with this uh, new framing. And we're hoping to bring also the best and the brightest because we're going to launch uh, the thought leader group. When we think about social and human sciences, one very concrete example is this program on digital anthropology. This is a program we launched uh, last year with the Leap Center, a, a, a data business uh, uh, group that is that is interested in, in, in understanding better. And, and I was just saying, okay, what, what it has to do, no? Anthropologist and digital how you combine these two, no? Anthropology seems to be a science from the past to look at past civilizations. Well, no, it's amazing because the kind of insights they can give you of how we humans change when creating communities in the digital space is super rich and no other science can tell you. How you change your own identity when you get into the metaverse. You create your own avatar with a different, a different personality. A different, I don't know. Maybe you like yourself and you create something that is exactly like you. Maybe not. But at the end, this interaction with the technology and also with the other people that use the technology shape different communities, different societies. And therefore, it, it really sheds light. And, and when we uh, deliver on, on using anthropology to understand digital communities, we also launch a contest to look who was using anthropology for very concrete uh, problems in the net. And we found this group in Brazil that was using anthropology to identify how does it happen, the aggression to political leaders, female political leaders during campaigns in Brazil. Because they found that there is a, 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 a really very high instances of attacks on women participating in political campaigns. And through the digital anthropology, they understood how it was shaped, how it's defined, but more importantly, how to counter it, because it was embedded in the algorithms. Again, these biases that I was mentioned. Another group uh, formed a very impressive community of people that have suffered some kind of aggression in the net. 
And you know what happened, which was very interesting, because this is about humans, it's about us, how we feel, how we interact with the technologies. We are not robots. We, we have our own feelings. What happened is that they created this space and originally they were thinking about producing solutions for the people that were aggressed in the net and good luck. What happened is that by connecting all these people that have suffered the same, they created a fantastic space that you don't need any healers. I, I think that decision making uh, in general and more in the economic field, which is the more important, has been captured by quantitative economics and therefore modelings. And this is the same what happens with artificial intelligence. You build models that then you don't even understand why they behave the way they behave. What I'm saying is that these sciences, anthropology, humanities, history, use history just to take decisions and learn from the past is so simple, might help us to get better solutions. And it's not a difficult proposition to understand. It might help us, for example, with the goal of Secretary General Guterres to go beyond GDP. We are bound to measure our progress with GDP growth. Does it really capture the multidimensional character of human beings? You are not only a consumer or a producer, you're not only a worker. You are a human being with dreams, with, with, with ideas, with a family, with responsibilities, with solidarity. How do we foster these other neglected areas when we measure progress? Well, you do it by documenting it. You do it by bringing these insights by understanding better what uh, does psychology tells you. The COVID was a perfect example. The COVID pandemic was managed principally by epidemiologists and by economists. And that's why you have the life or livelihood debates, whether you confine and you kill the economy or whether you don't confine and then the, the... And we are not only bodies to be saved, or workers to be given the opportunity to produce, we are human beings. And the problems that we have now with the very step increase on mental health issues is because we define, we took a very narrow definition of what it means to be human, a body to protect or an economy to save. But we didn't understand that we are relational beings, that we need to be together that we need to, to, to hold each other, that we need to, to know that somebody cares for you. We would have needed in those committees that handled the COVID more social and human sciences. We would have needed the psychologist, we would have needed the anthropologist, the philosophers, at least to pose the questions. Do we really need to confine the way we did for the young population? And then you have this 200% increase on mental health problems. Could we have done it differently? And I don't know, I don't have all the answers, but at least the questions and the perspectives from the science should have been there and probably we would have handled better. That's the whole proposition. The fact that you have so many actors uh, dealing with the issues, uh, universities, experts, uh, governments at different levels of responsibilities, um, it's only, um, a development that we just need to factor in in the in the work we do, uh, because what we, if, if we want to be successful as an institution with our normative work, we need to understand with whom are we working, and what their capacities and responsibilities are. Cities have very different capacities than the federations, but they have very strong capacity because they're very close to the people, and they have some responsibilities. So yes, we work with cities. We launched the mo the, the the largest network of cities, of inclusive cities, 700 cities that are bound together by their willingness to protect people and to ensure that in their cities the protection of human rights is ensured and that there is no discrimination and, and therefore why would you not rely on them to advance uh, your own normative work or, or your own learnings or, or your own analysis? We do it. We do it with NGOs because civil society, even though now we have this problem of the shrinking civic space in many countries because of uh, the increased uh, authoritarianism in so many, in so many countries, 
but at the end the civil society has earned a space also to have a voice and to be engaged in the decision making because we know the more diverse you are the more inclusive you are in these debates and in, in advancing the concrete solutions the more solid they are and therefore we work with all of them the city of grass in in austria uh, they declare themselves the city of human rights and what does that mean with that does mean that that you ensure that uh, lgbt community that uh, people with different origins uh, people with disability are provided the services they they need and so when they define public services education or health or transport they do not neglect those that are more vulnerable on the contrary they design the policies taking into account how they will ensure that these communities that usually are discriminated are going to be benefiting and also will be supported by the by the decisions they take the city of Moju in Korea they they for example during covid were one of the first to realize that all of the decisions that we were taking to protect people from covid uh, uh, the transmission that was the confinement and and the teleworking and were not integrated integrating the question of people with disabilities because you say don't touch use a mask don't go to public are you telling that to a blind person how would she or he survive if he is blind and therefore they develop a handbook and they put it in their decision making to all the services that the special consideration for all these measures to tailor them to the needs of people with disabilities and therefore just this conscious of of the cities that 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 we live in a world that is highly unequal where many groups are really always facing two or three times the hurdles to make ends meet need to be considered on on top and then to promote broader campaigns because the cities have also this possibility of impacting directly the people uh with their with their campaigns the fact is that one thing is to produce the knowledge with their expertise with their issues another thing is how do you ensure that this knowledge has impact and therefore the convening power also of unesco is important uh we launch for example and this is an annual event that that is happening recurrently the global forum against racism and discrimination this is an amazing place and it was meant to be because we launched it in 2021 and it's still in the context of the pandemic but we have 5000 people connected which tells you that people care to learn from each other how are we dealing with the question of racism and discrimination uh, the the second edition uh, took place in mexico and there it, it was impressive because you have the academics that come to tell you structural racism how do we address it how do we make sure that the, in the urban development you do not always lower the price of communities whenever they have certain colors in certain countries how do we ensure that the good services as i said on transport health reach those people how do we ensure that the opportunities that children have are not linked to their color of their skin these things were discussed in the forum are being discussed in in this forum in the global forum against racism and discrimination but they are discussed by academics that come with their new knowledge fantastic they are discussed by champion champions no we had martin luther king kaila satyarthi this this fantastic people that are doing their contribution to build a, a more uh, a, a better world uh, they are discussed by the policy makers because i am convinced that whatever we do doesn't impact policies would not have the traction that we need uh, is discussed by youth we always have youth it is discussed by by people from different uh, uh, countries different regions different professions it's it's really a com- this convening power because that give you the magic of coming out first inspired and knowing that you have many others that worry about the same things and that's super good second you might come with better solutions or reframing the solutions that you had already decided but that you heard some others that are uh, doing the same and that's why this network of 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 commonalities are are super useful uh the 700 uh, cities that we have for inclusive uh, societies and, and and champions of inclusiveness they are really changing all the time 
because they have the same problems. How do you deal with constraining budgets and, and then catering for different groups and, and making sure that all this hate speech that is all around the, the nets, uh, the, the internet, and the, and the mounting uh, discrimination, how you do, do you deal with it? And then you talk to others that are with the same problems, and I feel this is really helping also in another way uh, our, our contacts and our champions to, to deliver better. We need to talk. We have lost the capacity to talk to each other. We have lost the capacity to listen to different points of view. With the echo chambers that we produce in the social networks, because we are talking to the people that speaks like us, thinks like us, behaves like us, we are really preventing ourselves from connecting with people that come from very different cultural backgrounds, with very different ideas, with very different points of view. But we need to engage in a meaningful conversation. And that's what we are promoting, trying to see whether this is enacted in the laws, if we ensure that whenever you take a decision, you make sure that you open the debate to very different points of views that might collide with your, your own points of view, that we make sure that we respect the right of people to think differently, that we ensure that uh, it doesn't matter your religion, your background, your origins, you need to be considered in your own worth and your own dignity. And what is very interesting is that it's no different. Fostering intercultural dialogue is no different than fostering democratic dialogue. Because democracy is about all points of view. It's about listening to everybody to, un to get the better solution. And this is what is at stake. Because if we don't listen to each other, among countries, there is war. There's nobody to talk. If we don't listen to each other as a society, we become fragmented, divided. And this is what is happening now. The radicalization of the political options has to do that we don't listen to each other. And therefore, we need to foster this, this uh, dialogue and this we need to talk. No, We need public debates that are civilized, where we exchange facts and where we don't only try to prevail in the conversation. But then we also go with the schools, of course. Uh, and we have master classes. And that's fascinating because it's about understanding the, 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 the point of view of other communities, because even exposing yourself to other cultures. And for people like me that have been living in France of, for so many years or studying in the US or going to live in another, you realize that the reality is that the cultural mindset shapes definitions that are different, but they don't need to collide. They don't need to crash it, uh, among each other. We need, to, we need to engage in a meaningful discussion. So the master classes has really uh, reached thousands of kids all around the world, also with the associated schools of, uh, of UNESCO. And what we do is that we engage with kids, not to tell them top down what you need to do, but, but to engage them in understanding themselves, whether they are prepared for that dialogue or not, because it's a personal experience. Foresight and prospective studies are just a mean to define better options for today. Because trying to understand what are the trends, what are the, uh, the, the kind of outcomes that we can get on social, environment, economic, uh, in the future, just by the trends that we have today, is really important. When you do that, what you're doing is actually questioning the kind of decisions that we're taking today, that are always constrained by, by the definitions that we have. But we need to get out of that, those definitions because we are not delivering. We are not delivering on inclusive societies. We're not delivering on the climate transition. We're not delivering on so many areas. And therefore, we might as well break up with our thoughts of the past and try to bring forward these capacities to, to, to deliver uh, different ways of doing things that we could not even consider before. And, and it has proven super powerful. Now, uh, futures literacy is not only being used by 30 or 40 chairs that we have and growing. Chairs are these uh, academic uh, institutions that develop the knowledge linked to these uh, definitions that UNESCO produce. But also we have governments that are asking us, can you bring the futures literacy? Because we want to uh, uh, bring uh, more options, more options 
to the education systems or we want to bring more options to uh, the, the urban development. Uh, and, it, and it's a very good exercise. But Spain, for example, we were talking with the, with the area perspective of, uh, of, the, of the, actually, uh, as usual, those that are uh, bound by the same concerns come to ask for help, <laughs> but they're doing it. And so they have a prospective unit and they want to, uh, to use it also to define issues uh, related to, to gender. How do we make progress, uh, more progress on, on gender issues? Um, and again, we are bound to our, uh, to our trajectory. We are bound to a certain trajectory defined by the decisions we take today. And with these, technolo with these uh, tools we, we are opening up, uh, we were using these also with, uh, with Greece uh, that wanted to, to look at the tools they have in the government uh, to challenge the decision making that whenever you take a decision in certain areas on health or education, that you can pass the test of the future literacy to just to make sure that you have considered all of the, all of the options. The annual competition on the um, photography in the Silk Road, uh, it's, um, it's calling for young uh, photographers uh, to capture certain aspects of the cultures. Sometimes we ask them to capture uh, the, the production of uh, clothes. And, and you might say, well, but that's not a big thing. It's just impressive when you see the kind of pictures they take of the, of the, of the beautiful dresses or the beautiful coats or the beautiful... And it's also at, attached to how this uh, group of, of, of people, these societies, uh, live together and, and how they respond to the climate. And how, so it, it really tells you much more than what, what is the, 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 the dress look like. Uh, we receive thousands of uh, photographs each year. It's, it's, it's sad to, to, to always define who are the winners, but at least we need to define 20 winners. And then we produce this book, uh, Youth Eyes for the Silk Roads. So it's the eyes of the young people that are that are capturing in these wonderful images every year, because we have this production of the book every year, um, in, in also trying to disseminate and give visibility of the contributions of this region to the world. But this is also uh, putting the attention on youth, because UNESCO is, is very focused on, on this uh, uh, youth community. Uh, we were the first institution um, 20 years ago to include a youth forum this back to back uh, to our general conference. So it's not only uh, promoting um, uh, exchanges with youth and listening to youth, what they have to say, young people, what they have to say about uh, the state of the world of, or, or the work of UNESCO or the decisions of the general conference, but also for them to come and engage and then deliver a message to the member states. It was the very first institution. I know that now many institutions are bringing the young people to exchange, and, but, but UNESCO was the very first one. But besides that, we have been always um, tailoring solutions for the youth needs. And uh, we work with the Mediterranean, for example, when, when, we, when, when there was the uh, Arab Springs, uh, Arab Spring, we knew it was uh, pushed by youngsters and therefore youngsters that needed to have opportunities for employment, opportunities for education, opportunities. And we started working with them with the support of the European Commission. And now we have uh, another program because the question of uh, 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 misinformation and fake news and we are in a, in a very uh, rich information world a world where we cannot identify what is false for, from uh, truth and, and how do we ourselves equip ourselves to be critical in, in, in the myriad of this amazing uh, wave of, of information. So what we are doing with the young uh, people with whom we work now is to encourage them to do research, uh, to try to get solutions through analytical pieces that then they can share with us. And the very first one we launched was the youth as researchers on COVID. Because again, we want to engage with them. And we all say we want to engage with them. UNESCO is very good at engaging with youth, going to youth that are not the usual ones that come to you, but also trying to reach those that are not so engaged. 
And then when we launched the Youth as Researchers, we had 11,000 young people all around the world wanting us to take a look at the research, responding to one question, what COVID has meant for you? And it was impressive. And therefore, for me, these Youth as Researchers deliver very, very interesting the question of mental health. Many young people telling us it's the very first time that I have somebody I know that doesn't want to leave, that is anxious, that is depressed, that is the mental health problem for you that has increased 100%. They also brought it to the table. But the, but the other part is that they also want to bring solutions. And they want to tell us how do they believe we can improve the decision making. And I feel that this exchange is fantastic because then we are really delivering not lip service of engaging with youth and listening to youth, uh, really taking the their recommendations by the hand, putting it in front of our member states and saying, what are we going to do about it? How are we going to be responding to youth? I was in the COP27 with the, with the uh, Youth uh, Climate Action of UNESCO because we have a group of, of young people that are really focusing on climate. And they were telling me, oh, please, uh, UNESCO needs to empower youth. We need to, em and I said, no, you are empowering us. <laughs> Keep on being strong. Keep on bringing your perspective. Keep on bringing your dissatisfaction with how the, 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 the we that are taking the decisions are doing it. Because in that way, we have leverage, probably to counter vested interest, to counter the, the trajectory in which we are, but they are more daring. And I think that we are trying to recover that, that power from youth to change the stance, because we need to change the stance. The General History is a program that UNESCO um, advanced since the very beginning of its existence. History was one of the social human sciences that countries wanted to invest. And the general histories, of course, were produced for many regions, but the general history of Africa gained a lot of traction because it was a way in the context of the decolonization and the, and the, and the uh, uh, many countries that were being independent, it was a way to write their own, their own history. And that's really important because many times history of Asian civilizations are uh, written uh, through the eyes of uh, Western institutions or those that have the means to, to really pursue uh, uh, important uh, research uh, work. Uh, but with the general history of Africa, what UNESCO did was to engage uh, the experts from the regions. And, and, it, and, and what happened is that uh, it created a different narrative about what Africa is. Because in our general textbooks, Africa was born almost when the colonizers arrived, because it's the very first time when you start taking notes. But no, before that, there were empires. They were civilizations. They were ways of doing things. And we are recuperating, for example, the kingdoms that were there before. How do they, we don't know about these things, but we need to know because they shape the societies as, as they are now. And you also recover this, this magic of knowing that you also belong to this broader civilization of the past. Um, I am Mexican, I can tell you, I'm you know, coming from the Mayans, the Aztecs. It provides you with a sense of uh, understanding of what your culture is in a different way. And therefore, recovering this aspect for, for the African history was super important. But it's also important that we bring this knowledge, as you say, not only to the, to the general public, when we publish the 11 books that we have published, and we're going to publish the 10 and, and, and 11 uh, soon, uh, but that we also translate that into different ways of teaching history. I can say that, that, that young people um, trust UNESCO. I can say it without false modesty uh, because I come from many other settings, multilateral settings, and, and UNESCO has a positive footprint in its history. And therefore, what I found when I engage with youth is that they trust UNESCO. 
actually they demand a lot from UNESCO and sometimes you wonder me I'm the one that wonders am I am I able to deliver on what they expect from UNESCO to do but I feel that that uh, it's amazing they they trust that we can deliver and as I said that is empowering also for the institution we are not perfect uh, no institution is perfect but I feel that the that young people uh, are comfortable when they come to talk to UNESCO